Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. I am very excited about this new arrangement. And one of the main reasons why, as well as one of the main reasons why uh, the shepherds and Brian and I wanted to have a Lord's Supper service is so that we can completely focus on the Lord and on what He did for us for this entire first service. I'm just so excited about that. I think that's going to help us so much to be able to focus on the Lord even more than we normally do when we, when we take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. And I do believe that partaking of the Lord's Supper really is the most important reason why we come together. I don't say that it's, you know, the only real reason we have to come together and the other stuff is just a bonus. No, the other things we do on the first day of the week are necessary and crucial and, and vital and important and all that. But I do believe that the Lord's Supper is the most important thing we do together. And the reason that I believe that is because of Acts 20 and verse 7. Of Acts 20 and verse 7, which says, On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread... Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look at the context of that and look at that verse itself and really focus on learning just how important the Lord's Supper is for us. What was going on here is this was... The, the second leg, the last leg of the third missionary journey that Paul was on. And so he was heading back. And he was heading back to Jerusalem. And probably, ultimately, he would have also gone to Antioch of Syria, where he began uh, and ended the first two journeys. But he wanted to get to Jerusalem, if possible, by Pentecost. That's what we see in verse 16. So He's got a goal. He's got to get there in a certain period of time. At least he really wants to. But his travel plans are thwarted because there's a plot for his life that the Jews make. And so he's not able to go to the port and sail from, from Greece where he spent the winter in Corinth. And so he was going to sail from Greece to Jerusalem. He wasn't able to do that. That would have been a much faster way to travel. So he has to turn around and he has to to travel by land and go up through Achaia and Macedonia and, and kind of hook around to, and he went to Philippi, and, uh, and then there's Troas right over here, and there's some water in between. And so you have to, to sail across. And we read in Acts 20 and verse 6, we sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came to them, that is the other traveling companions they had already sent ahead of them to go to, go to Troas, uh, and came to them at Troas within five days. Now, if you know anything about the geography of the land there, that's a pretty shocking number. Because on the second missionary journey, from Troas to Philippi after the Macedonian call, it took two days. And now here on the third journey to travel from Philippi to Troas, it took five days. And he's kind of in a hurry because he wants to get to Jerusalem at a certain time. So he's already been slowed down because he had to travel by land. And, and now this trip takes five days to get from Philippi to Troas. And then we read the last part of verse 6, and there we stayed for seven days. Now again, if you understand the whole context, that's a pretty surprising number. <coughs> he's in this great big hurry. And he sticks around in this one city for seven days, not going anywhere. Why? What was so important that Paul would halt his very important trip to, uh, to wait around? Well, we read the answer in verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. So why did he wait around for seven days? And by the way, I think that that means he must have gotten to Troas on a Monday. He just missed 
the Lord's Day. I'm sure he would have loved to have been there that previous Sunday, but he missed it. So he waits Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then the first day of the week comes. And what does he do on the first day of the week? He does what the rest of the brethren do. They gather together to break bread. And yes, Paul preached, and I have no doubt that they did all of the other things that we do on the first day of the week. But the text highlights they gather together on the first day of the week to break bread. Now, the first day of the week is so important because that's the day that the Lord raised from the dead. The first day of the week is the day that the church started in Acts chapter 2. And so that's why the Apostle John in the book of Revelation calls the first day of the week the Lord's day. The emphasis was now the first day of the week instead of the seventh day of the week like it was uh, in the Old Testament. But it wasn't just that he wanted to gather together and worship with his brethren. Yes, that was it. It wasn't just that he wanted to preach to them and to talk with them and to be with them and to say farewell to them. Yes, that was that was part of it. But the text indicates we were gathered together on the first day of the week to break bread. What does it mean to break bread? That term can mean eating a common meal. In most contexts, that's what it does mean. Now, if that's what it meant here, would that make any sense? Here's Paul in this enormous hurry, and he waits around for seven days in one city so that he could meet with his brethren on the Lord's Day and eat a common meal. Does that make any sense whatsoever? Of course not. That that would not make any sense. And besides... Couldn't he have met with his brethren on any day of the week just to eat a common meal? Isn't that what the early church did in Acts 2 and verse 46? They met together from house to house and they ate their meals in simplicity and gladness of heart, right? Especially if Paul was in a hurry, wouldn't he have met on any day of the week? Probably would have wanted to do it as soon as he got there on Monday. Meet with the brethren, eat a common meal. But there was some some other meaning for this breaking of bread. You remember that when Jesus started the Lord's Supper, we always say He instituted the Lord's Supper, and that's a good term, but all that means is He started the Lord's Supper. When He started the Lord's Supper, He broke the bread, and He gave it to His disciples, and He said, Take, eat, this is My body, which is for you. And so... You also remember that in the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul said, is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? You might say, well, okay, but why here in Acts 20 and verse 7 does Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, just mention the breaking of the bread? Why doesn't he say that when we were gathered together to break bread and to divide the cup or and to partake of the uh, fruit of the vine? Well, I think what we have going on here is synecdoche. Now, I don't use big words very often. Synecdoche is simply a word that means a part for the whole. Okay? If if you have cattle, you might say, I've got 20 head of cattle. And what that means is you've got 20 cattle. The head stands as a, a part for the whole. Here, I think we've got synecdoche. This is the breaking of the bread standing for the whole Lord's Supper. Now, the breaking of the bread is half of what we do. There's the breaking of the bread, and then there's the fruit of the vine. So I think that this is synecdoche. And there's no doubt in my mind at all, and I think in the context it's clear, this is talking about the Lord's Supper. And so they gathered together on the first day of the week for the express purpose, chiefly, not only, but chiefly, to partake of the Lord's Supper. Now you might say, well, what about 1 Corinthians? And chapter 11 and verse 20, just want to bring this one up real quick. Paul said, Paul said, therefore when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Well, how can that work with that other passage? Well, in this context, he's talking about eating the Lord's Supper as a common meal. They were eating the Lord's Supper as a meal. And so that's not the purpose of the Lord's Supper. 
And besides this, you know, this still shows the importance of the Lord's Supper. They were just twisting it and perverting it. So I said all of that to say that I do believe that Scripture teaches that the most important reason we gather is to take of the Lord's Supper. And now the logical question to ask is, why? Why would that be the most important thing of all the things that we do? There's preaching and there's teaching and there's praying and there's uh, the offering of the contribution and then there's the Lord's Supper. We do all of those different things. So why would the Lord's Supper be the chief reason why we gather together? Well, we could give a lot of reasons for that. But the one I want to focus on is because it is a commemoration of the death of our Lord on the cross, of His body and of His blood. And Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And so we need to remember what Jesus did for us. We need to think about the Garden of Eden, of, not of Eden, the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus allowing Himself to be arrested. And then how they took Jesus and how they mocked Him and they slapped Him in the face and they beat Him and they put a crown of thorns on His head. And the only way for a crown of thorns to stay on your head is if it's pressed into your scalp. And then they took a reed and they beat Him over the head as He wore that crown of thorns as they made fun of him and said, prophesy, who is it that beats you? Because his face was covered. He couldn't see. Then they took him and they scourged him. And they compelled him to carry his own cross. And then they nailed him to a cross. The word became flesh. And here Jesus, God in the flesh, was giving his body. His body. This is my body, which is for you, Jesus said. He gave His body for us. And He died on the cross. You know, Jesus said when He started the Lord's Supper, this is my blood of the covenant, some versions say of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the remission of sins. Uh, blood represents life. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, Hebrews 9.22. And so, Jesus suffered, He gave His body, and He died for us. And those are the things that we think about. And it's not just thinking of the events, but we are to also remember why those things happened. Why did Jesus go through all that? So that we might have forgiveness. He was paying the price that we deserve. And this was part of God's eternal plan before the foundation of the world. This was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world, as it were, as Peter said. And so for all of those reasons, in this commemoration, we are remembering the most important thing that ever happened. It is the very crux of God's plan. The very centerpiece of all human and divine history. And so that's the reason why taking the Lord's Supper is the most important part of what we do together as a congregation. It's the most important part of what we do because we're remembering the most important thing that ever happened. And therefore, we need to partake of this in a worthy manner, examining ourselves. We need to give this time of our worship the proper attention and focus and to push out of our minds any thoughts that might be competing to, to take our attention and any distractions and we need to do what Jesus said to do, which is remember Him. And, re and remember why He did it. Because we have get gathered together on this first day of the week for the primary purpose to break bread. <laughs>